Hello, everybody. I am Mark Lavecki. I am the executive editor of Providence Magazine, and I am here with Daniel Strand, who is... Hello. Did you say hello? I did. No, it's polite. Daniel Strand, who is a professor at the Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery. And we are here for the third episode of True North. Uh, in this series, we are giving an overview of the classical just war tradition. Uh, this is the third episode, as I've said, we've done two already, an overview of the whole tradition and a specific look at legitimate authority. Today, we are going to be discussing just cause. Just cause is one of the three sometimes called deontological components of the use ad bellum uh, frame of the just war tradition meaning there are three primary things that have to be in place before going to war can be considered justified. You need a legitimate authority, you need a just cause, and you need a right intent. Uh, today is just cause. So Daniel, launch us off. What is just cause and why is it necessary to have a just cause before you embark upon a war? Yeah. Um... So people will debate exactly what is the primary of the main three. Some people will emphasize authority. Um, right intent usually is not lifted up as like kind of the most primary, but it's usually um, authority or just cause is kind of, you could say which one's, which one's, you know, takes precedent maybe. Um, but leaving that aside, uh, it is at least in, and this is go, <clears throat> goes all the way back to the Greeks and Romans, um, that e even if when you read these accounts of the Roman Senate deliberating, you find it just a bunch of smoke and mirrors, they at least thought they had to have some reason, a good reason, some injustice that was done. And that is carried over into what we call the Christian just war tradition or whatever you want to call it, Latin. Um, Augustine emphasizes this. And when you see it in, um, um, in, in debates in canon law and in the sort of theological um, formulations in the medieval period, it, it also plays a, a primary role that there, there needs to be some fundamental wrong that was done. Um, and this leads to the way it's formulated today at least <clears throat> in terms of the UN Charter, Article uh, um, 51 um, says that all war must be in self-defense. Now that's, I think, a, a problematic way to state it. You can understand why when the UN Charter was written, um, it, was, it was written that way. Um, at least it has to do with the vision of the UN. But I, I think it, at least it's, some, it's, it's carrying forth the, the spirit, if not um, or at least it's trying to, I think it's, I think you and I would probably agree that it doesn't quite capture, in many ways, it's probably uh, deficient, but at least it's capturing this idea that there needs to be a wrong in that, whatever that wrong is, and you can, you can kind of break down with those, with the traditional way that those wrongs have been discussed, but there needs to be a wrong being done um or potentially done i mean this is this is a big debate today which is you know on sort of pr pr um, what's called a preventative war or um a preemptive war it's a distinction that they make but if a war is about if a wrong is about to be done um especially when it comes to issues of of drones or remotely piloted aircraft and the use by the american and other governments some would argue that um, that's not a legitimate cause that um, t you know terrorists in Somalia uh, building bombs, um, even if we know that they've committed wrongs in the past and that they were explicitly allied with Al Qaeda or some other cell that's related to terrorist organization that wants to inflict harm on America or our allies. Some would say that's not sufficient um, and we get into a lot of other issues, but that's, um, so I'll stop right there before I get off on too much of a tangent. Yeah, well, that, that that's great. I mean, that that's a ton of stuff, right? So let's try to break that down. I think when we first gave an overview of the Just War tradition in our first episode in this series, we talked about how uh, um, the Just War tradition, you know, looks at, uh, you, you, you've got the three 
deontological criteria of right mm -hmm. authority, mm -hmm. just cause and right intent. And Jim Johnson in articles past has said that these map nicely onto Augustine's understanding of the three political goods, right? Of order, justice, and peace. So legitimate authority is proper order. Right. Uh, just cause is justice, mm -hmm. right intent is peace, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you've identified that, that if, if just cause has something to do with justice or specifically an injustice, then there's been some wrong that has to be righted, right? And if it has to be righted, then the implication is it is a sufficiently grave injustice, right? Not just any old injustice, a snub, some sort of modest territorial violation, an accident, something like this. It has to be pretty, pretty grave. Then you've touched on the on the understandability but inadequacy of pointing to self-defense as the mm. justified cause. And I wonder if this begins to correspond with this notion of injustice, because one wouldn't have to work too hard to imagine that there's some forms of self-defense that I actually have no right to. Is that possible? Such as what would you what would you say? Well, if I attacked you mm -hmm. because I wanted your glasses. Mm -hmm. and you attack me back, um, if I start to defend my, you know, now, now let's imagine a wild hyperbole that you start to just pummel me, all right? We can suspend disbelief and accept this. And I start to try to defend myself against you. Technically, if I'm the aggressor, I don't have a right to self-defense. Right. Right? Um, so to simply say self-defense is, is in some ways potentially misleading. Um, I think that's why you know, you know, Thomas Aquinas breaks it down and he has qualifiers, protect the innocent. Oh, I could be innocent. In this case, you were innocent. I was trying to snatch your glasses. Um, you have a right to defend yourself because you're innocent. You know, you're undeserving of the attack, <coughs> right? And that certainly works as with individuals for nations. Yeah. Nations uh, might not you know, be liable to attack. They've done nothing to warrant it. Uh, and now they, they have a right to self-defense because it was an unprovoked attack. And potentially other nations have a right to come to their aid because again, we're protecting the innocent. And so I yeah. guess that's my second problem with self-defense is it's sort of built into it that it's self-defense. Yeah. But what if right. some other dude is trying to take your glasses and I come along and I want to defend my friend, right? Do I have a right to do that? Yeah, so here's, here's why. And I want to hear what you think about this. Um, a lot of people want to root contemporary conversations of just war in the idea of human rights. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some, yeah, some people that we would, you know, that our, our colleagues would, would probably lean towards something like that, or at least see it as not problematic. And here's where I, I don't know, tell me if this is quibbling or I'd be interested in what you think. Is there, is there, because human rights language, I think collapses into exactly what you're saying. It doesn't have... Um, I, I'm, I'm fine with saying that humans have certain rights, but I think it needs to be grounded in sort of what I would just say a moral law of some sort. So <clears throat> the word law is something that I feel like stands over and above human rights and getting sort of grounds it moral law, transcendent law of some sort. And, you know, we're trying to discern what that is and it's not always clear, but um, I guess that's that's where I feel like you, it lapses into this incoherence because if we're just thinking every individual, um, the reason why we can make that distinction between people who can and can't who have a legitimate claim to defend themselves is because there isn't there's a there's a law above us that helps us to see that distinction. Otherwise, um, you know, if we just if we just say human dignity and so forth and work out from there, then I, I, I think you end up with um, an incoherent uh, position. Yeah. I'm, Unproblematic? Not problematic to me. <laughs> um, I can imagine it being problematic for many. What's, what's the, um, w why the turn to human rights is the justification for these sorts of things? What's the, what do you think is the grounding or what is the motive behind that? I mean, human rights is just the language that we all use today, at least amongst international lawyer. I mean, I can't see a lot of international lawyers. I mean, they have a, they have a, maybe they would say that there is some sort of moral law, but um, it wouldn't be a moral law that I think, I, I don't know what it would be. I think most of them make appeals to human rights because 
we no longer make appeals to something like a moral law. I mean, you, I can't imagine an international lawyer <clears throat> or many just war people who were not people of faith being comfortable with the idea of, an, of a transcendent law that grounds what we do. Right. Does that make sense? I mean, do, do you feel that same way or, yeah? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. Um, no, I absolutely do. And, 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 it, and it seems to me that one of the groups that benefits from maybe we can call it the classical just war perspective versus a human rights oriented perspective. One of the groups that benefits from the classical perspective, it seems to me would be the weak and the innocent, um, the powerless more specifically, mm -hmm. not just the innocent, the powerless, uh, because uh, simply because there's somebody out there who is having their rights trampled. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how that translates to me or you mm -hmm. having to mm -hmm. give a rip, right? right. Maybe somebody right. else has to take care of them. Um, why do their rights impinge on my freedoms or, or, or all of a sudden result in my having a duty? Right. If we're talking about something bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, then all of a sudden the, the, the burden shifts from simply trying to figure out who, who is responsible for meeting these rights. And all of a sudden, I just have a set of duties because I'm a human being and there are other human beings who need help. Yeah. Um, which gets us into all sorts of sticky things, right? So if, we, if we've said, I, I often break just cause into three discrete, obviously overlapping, um, but maybe, you know, separable uh, terms. One being protect the innocent, as we've said. Mm -hmm. The other is to take back what's been wrongly taken, mm -hmm. right? Territory could be stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third is to punish evil. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, th this punish evil thing, you're not going to find codified in customary international law. Mm -hmm. um, you might find the first two. Uh, you will find the first two. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's only in a, um, at least a moral universe, if not a God saturated universe in which something like punishing evil becomes a coherent expression of the use of force. Yeah. Right. Um, which brings us up against other terms that, that are the same, such as retribution. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's also not a wildly fashionable term, uh, both yeah. within and, and outside the church. Uh, but but to, to my mind, more shockingly, it's simply not a fashionable idea within the church. Yeah. Um, why? What do you, before we get into the retribution thing, I think it's, it's really important and we want to, just dwell on that for a second, um, or more than that. But um, well, I'm trying to think of an example. Is there? Can you give me an example of a war that's fought purely on retributive grounds, or as punishment, or is punishment a sort of dual motive, where okay, you're protecting the innocent, and punishment is always going to be a part of that. Or, um, or, or are there wars, you, you, you think, um, I guess we, you'd be thinking in terms of only intervention, interventionary intervention, type wars, where we would, we would ways, say, here's a wrong, we are going to, yes. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, in some ways, 9-11. I mean, in, in one regard, that was a, that was a one and done. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't strictly, but, you know, you could imagine mm -hmm. how it's a one and done. We've been attacked, we've been hit. Um, yep. Our people are already dead. There's nobody to protect right yep. now. We're not under continued assault. That has to be qualified. But mm -hmm. we're not under immediate assault. Yeah. Um, nothing has been taken. Like no territories yeah. have been seized. Yeah. Uh, and now all we've got left is a punishment strike. Now the dual use is that it's, you know, you're going after guys who are surely going to hit us in the future. It's a yep. deterrent. Um, sure. You know, you're, you're, you're eroding their capacity to hit us again those right. sorts of things. So, so your point. So it has a self-defensive aspect to it. Right. Even a future looking, right. A future look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least imminent enough where one could say plausibly that um, these, these people have struck and they will strike again. And so therefore there's we, that legitimate reason. What I would say, you know, full scale war, we might have to, to, you know, ask a good historian to find us a, an example of a pure act of retributive war but yeah. in terms of limited strikes, Saddam barrel bombs a couple, or Saddam Assad, don't hold it past Saddam either. Assad mm -hmm. barrel bombs some of his own people and we launch a limited strike to suggest strongly that he never do that again. 
Yeah. Right now, okay, I guess I've already clouded it because it's sort of protection of the innocent, a future deterrent, all of that. <clears throat> but it's also a retributive act. It's to say the victims mattered, um, will defend their memories, will requite the injustice to the degree that mm -hmm. we're able to. Yeah. Uh, but I guess it gets to the heart then, I mean, if you asked me that about retribution, um, I guess you could say the same thing about punishment in general, right? Mm -hmm. Why do we punish? Um, is punishment presumably always has something of a dual use component to it. You know, one of the strand boys socks the other strand boy in the face. It would never Frequent happen. occurrence, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Every day. Uh, why would you punish that? The act is done. Yeah. Right? So I mean, maybe we could keep it closer to home to begin chipping away at why this makes sense at the international stage. Yeah. That's a question, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pondering exactly what I'm doing when I'm putting him on timeout. Um, right. I mean, I'm doing a lot of things, and I think this. Um, I mean, I was thinking just on before I get to you know, what is retribution. I'm just pondering. I mean, I think, I think you you might make. Um, I'm thinking that the people's response to the assassination of of Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th right. I think, uh, I mean, but in, in you couch this in terms of war and terror, so I think that that goes along with it. But I think if you want a justification, I think the number one, you know, I'm just thinking that's a primary example prim of retribution. Right. Let's, let's, this this let's, is the guy who who is this, you know, point of the spear that did this, you know, incredibly evil thing, structure of human life, property. Now you could put a yeah, fine um, point to it that might not be necessarily true. Let's imagine that we knew through you know exquisite intelligence that he had stepped down. He's been put out to pasture by Al Qaeda, and he probably was at the time. Actually, he was he was not yeah, instrumental. Was, yeah, right? he certainly wasn't yeah. instrumental. It seems, and so yeah, at one level, now you could probably squish it and say, well, you you wipe him out, and it poses a certain deterrent to future you know, Osama wannabes, because they'll know that even in retirement, they could still be struck down. But that's pretty close to a pure act yeah. of retributive justice. Mm -hmm. um, and legitimate? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, let's, let's uh, return to retribution here. Um, why is this idea so... Uh, we could talk about my little boys, but let, let me just... Let's, let's frame this because... Uh, the real controversy, wh wh why is this idea so, I mean, to me, it, it doesn't, I don't know why, um, but within Christian circles today, I think the idea is fairly controversial. Right. Maybe it's not the majority, you know, I always, I always feel like we, we, we interact with academics primarily, and academics are a small little slice, and they tend to have not representative views, but nevertheless. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> uh, <n> <laughs> Either way, this is a prominent voice and it has a lot of purchase probably outside of its actual representation. So mm -hmm. why, is, why is punishment and retribution having, having a hard time? My snarky answer is because we don't know what love is. Okay, and say more. It's partially snarky, right? I think, it's, I think that's true, actually. Yeah. Um, so two, two different ver versions of love going on here. What's, what's your version and what do you think the other version um, would say? Well, my, my, my version is the right one. So uh, okay. uh, no, my, uh, you know, you start, you start with a couple, I mean, we could go all the way back to my conversion event, which we're, we're not going to, but right. I, I, I encounter the Holocaust, a study of it. And, and as an agnostic, I want the categories to hate evil and I don't have them, uh, but, but I want to understand what, you know, what does the universe have to say to that? I want someone to say something. And, you know, Christianity comes along, the Hebrew tradition comes along and says that, uh, you know, there is no room uh, in, the, in the presence of the divine for anything that is unholy. Hmm. Uh, you know, how much sin do I want in heaven? You know, about, about that much, mm -hmm. day, right? Mm -hmm. Zero percent. Yeah. Uh, so what's the remedy now for that? You know, what, 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 what is the, what is the solution to evil? 
uh, you know, some people just say, well, this, you know, the solution completely compatible with love is simply forgiveness. You just forgive. Yeah. And then I think, well, you know, here's the pickle with that. Mercy always costs somebody something, right? Mm -hmm. If you've heard me say much, you probably have heard me say that. Mercy always costs somebody something. And if in our beneficence, we decide we're going to show mercy to the evildoers, the aggressors, uh, then the people who are going to pay the cost of mercy are the victims. Mm -hmm. And that might be appropriate. There are times where the victim sucks it down and says magnanimously, um, I forgive you. And they accept the costs of mercy. Uh, but it seems to me, you know, channeling Nigel Bigger here, forgiveness has to come in at least two phases. The first is forgiveness is compassion. And that's to say that, look, I, I don't know how, how your history, you know, interpenetrates with your will and compels you to make certain kinds of decisions that I wish you wouldn't make. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that, but I do know that I am myself no stranger to a desire to abuse other human beings. Like, mm -hmm. just do that. Uh, yeah. And I also don't know how your history lessens your ability to resist that temptation. Uh, and I also don't know that if I shared your history, I wouldn't be making the same decisions and choices that you make. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a certain kind of compassion. I'm sorry you have done these things. I wish you didn't. Not just yeah. because it harmed me, but because I believe the person most harmed by sin is the sinner. And so I wish you weren't the kind of person who did this thing. That's forgiveness is compassion. It's unilaterally required by the victim because even victims have responsibilities. And that mm -hmm. sucks, but you know, that's how that goes. Yeah. And that's where that stops. But other people want us to push all the way forward and say to the kid who goes into a congregational prayer meeting and blows everybody away, that I just forgive that kid. Um, well, if you mean anything more than being compassionate, then no, because forgiveness as absolution, which is what I think most people think of when they think of forgiveness, forgiveness as absolution is, is requires that the first step be taken uh, by the aggressor. Right? There has to be a repentance. There has to be an acknowledgement that what I've done is evil and I need to apologize for this and I need to demonstrate uh, through actions, not just words, that I'm never going to do this again or that I desperately hope I will never do this again. Yep. Some effort at restitution, etc. And yep. if I, as the victim or you know, standing in the victim's behalf, try to short circuit that process of you know, the working of guilt and shame on the conscience of the evildoer, then I potentially short circuit their ability to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually unloving because mm -hmm. I've taken away their opportunity to come face to face with their, their own wrong to repent and to turn away from it. Yeah. Um, so so I the, but the, the issue here, so that's great. I mean, I, I think that's an important distinction, the forgiveness, the, 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 the pacifists that, that are, um, that, that tend to be the ones, I guess, it's not necessarily people only pacifists, but you know, the Howard Wasses, the Oders, and you know, and others along those lines, they would locate at least theologically this idea in the cross, right? That Jesus suffers, he does not repay, he does not strike back. Um, and that is the model. Um, what is your, and so the, the cross then forbids violent response. Um, how can a just warrior, I guess we could go down that rabbit trail too far, but just give us a quick, how does the just warrior then, um, what, is their, what is their theory of, of the cross? If, if that's, because the passive one has a certain appeal, you go, yeah, I mean, that kind of oh, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it appealed to me for a long time. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, we just, we modeled Jesus and this is, and, and, and that's the case. So what, what, how, what do you say right. back to them? My response to that is, is snarky, uh, is that the cross didn't do all that much, right? What do I mean by that? It did absolutely everything. Uh, the cross was efficacious for the, pro to, to solve the problem it was trying to solve. The problem that it was trying to solve is not how Mark Levecki sins against Daniel Strand. In a roundabout way, it should have, it, it should have resolved that because it should so change my heart that it remedies my desire to sin. Um, but it was, as I understand it, all about reconciling the breach between me and the ruler of the universe. And uh, the, the breach is there because I'm, I'm sinful and no sin can be in the presence of the holy. 
-hmm. and Christ opened the opportunity for me to be able to be acceptable in the sight of the divine. Mm -hmm. um, it fixed that problem. Yeah. Uh, so it fixed the problem of sin, but it, it didn't solve the problem of sinning. You know, neighbors still buy house keys. I mean, if Howard Wass is right, why does he buy a house key? Why does he use a pin code? It's because he knows other people want his stuff, right? Yeah. We still need armies. We still need all these things, um, you know, because those problems are still there. And so when my turning to nonviolence is efficacious in solving the problem I want to solve, then as a Christian, I should probably turn to nonviolence. Mm -hmm. But when nonviolence doesn't solve the problem that needs to get solved, I need to look for another solution. Yeah. Sometimes the solution is an F-35. Yeah. Right? So would you say, and I can just hear the pacifist chomping at the bit on this one. The pacifist chomp? <laughs> um, gently eating, you know, swishing around kale in their mouth because they want <laughs> animals or something. Oh, but, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, yeah. Um, non-aggressively posing a question would be so does the cross is the cross an act of violence i mean because that's what it sounds like i mean you're what, what you're saying sounds like penal substitutionary atonement sanctions mm. the use of violence uh in in practice not on, you know not on, in every conditions but at least provides for us a template for thinking about retribution that would undergird the just war tradition is that is that what you're saying uh yeah i mean i i i think it shows that there are occasions uh where you know violence or force or however you want to cash that out mm -hmm. has a place in um acts of love and acts of reconciliation um you know we i mean we we know that peace for instance is not simply a virtue peace might be the fruit of virtue mm -hmm. um but you know the virtues are complex and some of the virtues are courage and some of the virtues are anger you know all rightly displayed you know in the right moment in the right time for the right reasons against the right people for mm -hmm. the sake of the right people mm -hmm. all of that um, but peace is not necessarily a virtue. Um, it, it comes through the exercise of other virtues. Hmm. Um, and what you see in the cross is, you know, D.A. Carson, you know, is, is great with this because he says, you know, look, if you want to see divine mercy, well, look at the cross. If you want to see divine wrath, look at the cross. You see both of these principles barreling yeah. down the course of biblical history mm -hmm. until they meet in the cross. Mm -hmm. Right, it's it's Jesus who talks more than anybody else about hell. Right, yeah. he's the one who flips over tables. He didn't save us from some Old Testament son of a bitch. Right, that wasn't <laughs> his job. That's not what yeah. he did. He was that Old Testament God. He is that Old Testament God. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's there's no. Yeah, there, it's uh. Because some people want to say that Old Testament God. And I don't know necessarily how the, the pacifists are going to reconcile this or people who are, are kind of defending this or critiquing the view of retribution, punishment, retribution as, as, as an authentic expression of justice mm. or the God of the Old Testament. I'm not, I'm not really sure how they would, how they would say that, um, how they defend it, but they, I do, it does seem like they reject the idea of retribution. Uh, or legitimate punishment, which could include violence or force, right? Violent, I guess violence is a lot, those are, can be loaded terms, but, um, but it seems like that what, what they would argue, and then we can, we probably, at least with this episode, is that there's, there's justice and there's love, and there's sort of like two competing things going on here, right? Right. And the New Testament, Jesus' love, which is sort of unconditional acceptance. And that means even if someone hits you, you're still going to accept and not use retribution. But it sounds like you would you wouldn't you you would reject sort of justice on one side, love on the other, or how would you how would you say it? On your on your position. Yeah, yeah. I I, I certainly would want to pit them against each other or even see them as opposites yeah you know, the same action i mean i you know mm -hmm. what 
you know, I've got, I've got one neighbor whom I, I am called to love and he is kicking apart the face of another neighbor whom I am called to love. Mm -hmm. And I know that I am supposed to love both of them, but I also know I cannot love both of them in the same way, in the same moment, but I have to love both of them. And, and so whatever action I do that is motivated by a sense of justice uh, for the victim, uh, it's, it's almost interchangeable. It, it, the desire for justice is motivated, is grounded in love for the victim. And, and how I enact that justice is also, when I see most clearly, an act of love for the aggressor because I know that he is the most harmed by the harm that he is doing and he needs to be stopped. We have it on good authority that he who turns a brother from the error of his ways, right, it is doing an act of love. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so love and justice is, is very often, it, it's, you know, it follows the same inertia, it follows the same prompting. Mm -hmm. um, you giving that time out to your kid, that's an act of justice, mm -hmm. but it's an act of love because I don't, don't want you to do these things. It's bad yeah. for you. Yeah. It's bad for the people you hurt. It's yeah. bad for you. Um, and, and, you know, we, we want to occasion in ourselves and other people a habituated preference for doing good things, right? Um, it, it helps to make us fit for heaven, in part because, you know, it's, it's only if we've cultivated virtues that we want to be in heaven in the first place. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I don't think that's going to be our sort of cup of tea. Mm -hmm. so, there's a lot Great. more to think about all this. What was that? There's a lot more to be said about all this, but absolutely. We're just skimming the surface here, people. And I'm sure there'd be <clears throat> many aggressive questions <clears throat> pointed at Mr. Levecki. But uh and you, you're I'm just speaking rhetorically <laughs> for you. That's yeah, I mean, I mean, Mark is 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 more I mean, I'm just playing a questioner here. Mark, I think, represents in many respects my own views. Um and uh, let me just say say one thing, and just because we haven't generated enough occasion for hate mail yet. Yep. Um I think, so this is a question, but I think with the Hauerwasians on the question of penal substitutionary atonement, I think, you know, God forbid, but I think we can throw C.S. Lewis in that lot too. Because when you read his section in Mere Christianity um, on the cross, he, he seems to dismiss, some of the language is a little bit ambiguous to me, and in other places he seems to say things that complicate this, but he yeah. seems to not like it one, you know, um, yeah, and I th and that's a, I guess something we could we could we can think about as we go forward is is why why is this idea I mean I think a lot of it has to do with the, the view of God honestly mm -hmm. um, that it it presents in some people's minds it doesn't for me and doesn't for you but I think for a lot of people reject that view of God as some sort of capricious arbitrary angry bully right who's beating up kids right um, and, and that's address that whatever else he is he's not arbitrary. Right. Right. And there's a reason for it. So, yeah. All right. We should sign off. We should. All right. We shall. Well, that was Thank true with episode. I don't know what, but part three of our series on just war. And we'll be back next time with a discussion on right intention. Goodbye. Take care. <laughs>